All right, so I'm working on Umbra's head. Hopefully we can actually see what I'm doing today. I think you should be able to. Hopefully, I adjusted the camera angle a little bit. Um, so yesterday I kind of got the eyes laid in more or less. Um, I like this one better right now. So I'm gonna try and adjust this one a little bit. I also need to work on his face more. His jaws are really weird and not even at all and stuff like that. So, yeah. I like having a lot of light. Unfortunately, it's really dark out today. It's raining. So I'm not getting any natural light, essentially. So I have on the room lights, and I have my multiple lights up here. I have four lights pointing right at what I'm doing, basically, from various angles. And this one, you can see it's only about, I don't know, six, eight inches away. I like having a hard light source like this. These are LED lights. Um, I like having that when I'm when I'm sculpting because it really casts everything into sharp relief. It makes it easier to see what's going on. It's nice to have a little bit of a softer light source for photos and for painting, so that it doesn't cast such harsh shadows. Um, and so I have a diffuse LED light. I don't know if you can see it way up there. Um, and I have some other lights that I pull out when I'm taking photos, or I put a piece of tissue paper as a diffuser over these lights. It actually, like a piece of Kleenex, it works pretty well. Although my photos still are not very good, I will admit that. I'm hoping that my new studio I can set up uh, a photo box of sort of photo booth sort of thing, a permanent spot so I don't have to reset it up every time, which would be really nice. Also make it a lot easier for me to take photos. If I was using a solid bead or something in here, I wouldn't have to worry so much about getting the eye shape rounded out, but I like being able to adjust where it is more easily and to adjust the shape a little bit because, like I said in my last video, which hopefully you didn't watch because it was terrible, um, <laughs> horse eye shapes are, horse's eyes and eyes in general aren't actually really round. They're kind of off round, not spherical. So using, I mean, you could use a appropriately shaped and even round, I mean, in this scale, it's not that big of a difference, if we're being quite honest. But there is a little bit of a difference. They have, like, a bulge in the middle, and 
stuff. I'm still not happy with that eye. It looks, I don't know, doesn't have the right expression. But try not to sit and work on any one thing too long because then that bit gets messed up in comparison to everything else. It gets out of proportion or just looks overworked, loses the life in it. So I think I mentioned that I'm going to bake or cure this part, his head, before I reattach it to his body, which is very convenient because it means I won't squish his face any, any once I'm working on the rest of him. But the problem with that is that unlike epoxy sculpt, which I keep mentioning because that's what I'm used to working in, I've only started working in Sculpey pretty recently, um, I think two sculptures ago. So I did, I did a Duelo and Esme are both done in Super Sculpey, this same stuff. Um, and I definitely learned some really good things from each of them. But one of those things is that Super Sculpey does not adhere to itself very well, cured to, um, uncured to cured. They don't, re the, the raw stuff really doesn't stick that well to the baked stuff, which is kind of annoying. Um, in Epoxy Sculpt you can you can stick that stuff to anything and just smear it in and it'll, it'll stick. Um, so working in parts like this is a little bit annoying because it's I'm going to have to try and get it, uh, it to bond around his jawline and around his ears. Um, and there are some ways that I'll deal with that. One thing I can do is I can actually put a little bit of, just a little bit of super glue onto the cured epoxy and then go ahead and squash raw epoxy onto that and the raw epoxy will bond I'm sorry, the super glue will bond the raw sculpey to it so basically I'll have like a thin layer of raw sculpey that's glued on there and then the uh, additional sculpey will stick to that layer of raw sculpey so that's what I do sometimes uh, it's, it's convenient um, another thing I could do is just not worry about the bond being too great and then fill in any cracks or anything with epoxy sculpt after I bake the whole thing. Since I'll need to go over the whole thing after it's baked anyway, because as somebody mentioned on my Facebook page, um, in a comment, it, it will crack when I bake it. I'll get cracks, probably, probably I'll get cracks in his barrel through here. Um, hopefully I won't get too bad in his legs, although I wouldn't be surprised if this leg gets some cracks because it has a little bit of flex in it. Um, and I can try and like suspend him off the ground while he's baking, but honestly it's sometimes easier to just fix the cracks. Um, so I'll need to fix those after he's baked anyway, which you can fill them with Sculpey and rebake, but I just use epoxy Sculpt. I have lots of it around. I have like buckets and buckets of it. So this is a four pound container that I think is basically brand new. Um, Plus, I do my final detailing in Epoxy Sculpt, so like my wrinkles, I have a method that I use, which I will demonstrate later. I've talked about it a few times online. I thin the Epoxy Sculpt with alcohol. I think I usually use like 91% isopropyl alcohol or possibly rubbing alcohol. Apparently those are different. My chemist roommate would yell at me, um, but they are. They are different things. Um, and I thin the epoxy sculpt with it to like a paste and then you can brush it on and you kind of use like this twisting motion with the brush and it lays down this very nice little beads of epoxy, not not beads like round, but beads like a like a bead of caulk. So you can do these wonderful veins and it's, it's very, very easy. Um, once you get the hang of the little wrist motion, it's like a little twisting guy. Um, so that works really well for me for doing veins and for doing wrinkles, and then for doing just kind of general skin texturing. Those horses don't have smooth skin. Really, very few animals have 
any bits that are perfectly smooth on them, sort of like the surface of their eyeball. Even that sometimes isn't that smooth. Um, if you look at my one dog who is very, very old and <laughs> has bad eyes. Um, but if I'm going to do that anyway with the epoxy sculpt, then there's no reason not to go ahead and just use it for other surface things too. I think it's more of an issue when people are doing dolls where the skin color is the color of the Sculpey, um, which the, some people do absolutely gorgeous work with Sculpey, but there they need, they're not going to be painting it, so they need the material to all be the same and to be very consistent and very clean. And I, I can't, I, I would love to make those things, but um, I can't keep my Sculpey that clean. You can see even this Sculpey that I've only been working on for a little while is full of little bits of crud. And it's not as obvious in the gray and it really doesn't matter at all because I'm going to, I mean, I'm going to cast him, so. And even if I wasn't going to cast him, I'd be painting him. I don't need to worry about what the surface coloration looks like. The surface texture is all that matters. But keeping your Sculpey clean for doing that those delicate dolls and figural sculptures. That, that's... <laughs> you probably have to have a cleaner work desk than I do, and you can see my work desk, it's got a epoxy sculpt, a layer of epoxy sculpt over a layer of paint, which is why the paint doesn't come off anymore. It's because I airbrush here, and apparently I sculpt here sometimes too, and it just, it just layers and makes a horrible disaster. I often watch something while I'm working on Netflix or somewhere online. There's no TV in here, um, so everything's online. But since I want to be talking at the same time, and if you, you guys don't need to watch whatever awful TV shows I happen to be watching at the moment, um, I also listen to audiobooks. I go through a lot of audiobooks. I uh, have an Audible subscription, and the library actually has audiobooks that you can download online, which is really nice because they're free and uh, audiobooks can be a little pricey if you're paying, especially if you're paying full price for them. But it's nice to have something to uh, keep me from getting distracted. I'm kind of easily distracted, especially by the internet and since I have to have my computer right here because that's where all my reference photos are, I can't get around having the internet available all the time. So. Having the camera on means that I don't mess around on the internet, I just work. I'm actually a lot more productive with it on, I think. Oh, I think we're making some progress. Another thing I meant to do before I started sculpting today was to pull out my uh, um, my anatomy book. I only really have one, but it's it's very good. It's Animal Anatomy for Artists, I think. It has various animals, but it focuses a lot on the horse. Um, it's got old um, plates, carvings, which were clearly done from life. You can, or from well, <laughs> a dissection. You can definitely tell that. And it's a very helpful book. Everything's labeled. I can never remember the names of, of the different bones and muscles and stuff. So if I, when I have uh, 
one of my artist friends critiques stuff for me. She knows the names of everything, so she'll say his, you know, occipital or whatever is off, and I'll be like, eh, oh, okay, and then I go look it up and see what she's talking about. <laughs> and she's usually right, and she knows what she's doing. And when, when I critique stuff for her, I'm like, something's off on this bone. It doesn't go quite like that. It goes a little bit the other way. And she's like, are you talking about his, you know, whatever. And I'm like, uh, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I just know what it looks like. I don't know what it's called. But it's definitely nice to know what it's called. I guess it would be very nice. I just don't have much memory for that sort of thing. I can remember what, where things are supposed to go, more or less not what they're called. But that's what reference photos are for. Lots and lots of references. That way you can see what, uh, how things actually look on the surface too, because not everything that you, not all the bones and stuff are really visible. and. Depending on the horse's position, some things are more visible than others. So it can really make a make a big difference. Which is one reason that it's not I don't I don't like sculpting from anatomy um, guides, I guess. I prefer sculpting from photos of actual horses. I don't want to end up with something that looks like like an anatomy study instead of, you know, a posed anatomy study. I want something that looks like it could be alive. Sarah Mink likes talking about all the goo and the squishiness, and she has a good point there. There's a lot of squishiness that just, everything moves and, I mean, there's definitely bones underneath everything and everything has, you know, it's anchors, but tendons wobble around. There's some amazing videos out there, high-speed videos, um, showing how the leg tendons can move, and they can just wobble from side to side. You can't see it in still photos. It's not obvious. But uh, in high-speed videos, everything's just going crazy, and it's amazing. You can see how helpful the, his little wire headstand is here. It means I can just set it down instead of having to carefully balance it and make sure that I don't squish things.
Oh, we're getting closer and closer. A little bit wide. It's very easy to make the horse's head too wide if you uh if you go out and actually measure across a horse's muzzle. It's only it's only a few inches wide just above the nostrils. It's very narrow. And uh I think a lot of people look at model horses and we kind of keep getting these wider and wider heads cuz so many briars especially have very wide heads. Um it's a sculptural thing. It's a it's a a stylistic thing that that some of briars main artists tend towards. And uh so I tend I try to make sure that I don't let my horses heads get too wide. Try to make sure that they stay realistic. That's what I'm shooting for here. So once again, I'm going to, I don't know where the camera's pointing, so I don't know if you can see my computer screen, but I'm just flipping my photo. I like this one because it lets me see the muscles of the jaw reasonably clearly. And it's easier to just flip it in the computer than it is to try and flip everything in my head. So large, clear reference photos are, are the best. Um, I've taken a fair number of my own, but I tend to use ones that I find online a lot. Google Image Search has a very handy feature where you can set the minimum size. So if you set the minimum size to like at least 800 by 600, but I prefer to set it even bigger than that, you'll only end up with images that are that at least have a chance of being usable. Because a lot of the times you see these images and they look great in the preview, but then you realize it's only like 300 pixels wide and you can't actually see any of the details. So if you set it bigger, you can really end up with more useful stuff and not get your hopes up when you find what looks like the perfect picture and then you realize that it's absolutely minuscule. a little bit tricky when I get down to his nostrils here because his whole face, I don't know if you can see how his whole face will shift when I put pressure on either side. If you run a wire down the whole nose before you start sculpting, that can help eliminate that. I just didn't. In this case, I should have thought ahead. But you just deal with it. I don't like running into wires while I'm working that get in my way that I then have to figure out a way to remove. So I tend to put in less armature, I tend to err on the side of less armature, which I don't know. I would rather deal with things being a little bit squashy than have to deal with removing wire or removing a, like aluminum foil. The instructions even say on Sculpey, say to like bulk up thick areas like the horse's uh, torso so that you have like a half inch layer all the way around but every time I do that I make it too thick to start with and then I have to carve it back down and then I'm hitting armature and I'm hitting aluminum foil or paper or epoxy sculpt or whatever I'm using and it's just a huge hassle so I do them solid it takes more material and it means they crack while they're baking but it means I don't hit armature
just marking the center line here. Probably something that would be a good idea to do early on, one way or another, but it helps with symmetry, and symmetry is so important on the face. And, well, <laughs> on a horse like this, there's not too much on him that's exactly symmetrical side to side, um, since all of his legs are in different positions from each other. And honestly, uh, real animals are often somewhat asymmetrical. I've seen some horses with ears that looked like they came off two different animals. Just just totally different one from the other. But symmetry is more appealing and if you're gonna push things like make deliberately asymmetrical ears, it's you can kinda tell the difference between things that are done deliberately and things that are just accidental. I think. Um, so, better to go for symmetry. I put my finger in this eye a little bit, I can see the and that's going to keep happening. I'll, I'll touch them up right before I bake them. And I'll probably have to touch them up afterwards too. You can carve Sculpey. Um, you can sand it once it's baked. It doesn't carve real well, I don't think, but you can cut it with an X-Acto knife or whatever. Again, since I'm working on him with his head detached, I can easily just turn him around. This is an angle you can't see it all on when his head is attached because his body blocks it. So this is one of the times that it's really nice to be able to turn his head around. Like straight on from above, that's not so bad. You can see that even when his head is on, but underneath the chin, and of course depending on what the sculpture is doing, it can be more or less difficult to get things symmetrical. On a horse with its head turned a lot, sometimes things will look symmetrical um, on the sculpture because of the the neck and all the other parts counterbalancing your asymmetry, but, but it turns out they're not. Sometimes they can look symmetrical to me, but then it turns out that they don't look symmetrical to anybody else. <laughs>
So I've mentioned about doing veining, and uh, I like to kind of paint it on an epoxy sculpt later on. And I do do that for some of the veins. Some veins, though, I will sculpt in the Sculpey, um, like specifically this the big facial vein that runs up in front of the eye, um, in front of the jawbone. That one I'll often sculpt in in the Sculpey. It's big enough, and I want to make sure that I put it in precisely the right position. A lot of the veins on the body, the very fine capillaries and stuff, um, they don't have to be in exactly the same position. They're kind of random, but some of them, the big belly veins and stuff, I want to make sure that they're in exactly the right place. So I'll either sculpt them on more carefully with the uh, when I do it with the epoxy sculpt, or more likely, if they're the really big ones, I'll just sculpt them in in the sculpey before I before I bake him, or even uh, do them separately in non-thinned epoxy sculpt. You can roll it out and make little little snakes, and then blend those in. Just depends on what sort of effect I'm going for. make sure I don't lose that line or that it doesn't get distorted. Alright, I'm going to take a little break, look at my footage here, and then I'll probably be back. Rocky, stop. Rocky Delphine. They're getting antsy because it's getting near their dinner time. Matching the sides of the face is one time where the mirror comes in very handy.
skylight really doesn't make any difference at all. Delphine Hush.
go ahead and add some vein um, with skin as thin as he'll have. I, 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 bleh, my reference has some pretty significant veins on his face, so I don't know if you can see that. As usual, I never know what you can see. Um, but I am going to go ahead and lay in some of those right now. Wearing the helmet for so long is actually starting to make my head hurt. This one doesn't fit me quite perfectly. I have a big head. Let's see if I can adjust it a little bit here. Sorry about the camera movement. head just right and move the helmet a little bit. I can see the little red light blinking that says that it's recording. <laughs> I got concerned there for a second that I'd somehow turned it off and forgot to turn it back on.
Sometimes when I'm sculpting, I intentionally sculpt the detail a little bit deeper and sharper than I want. And then I go over it with a layer of either gesso, um, airbrushed on, or of filler primer. You have to be really, really careful with that because it'll easily fill in details that, that you want. But if I've planned for that and intentionally sculpted everything very sharply, I don't usually spray it right over the eye or anything, but other areas, it can... I think of it as kind of like I'm sculpting the bones and the muscles and the fat and everything, and then the primer helps me to put a layer of skin over the whole thing, which it, it works pretty well sometimes. I like to do it a lot when I've do, done my um, my epoxy sculpt veining. It just kind of smooths everything out just enough to make it look really realistic and, and lifelike. So I'm... I'm very, very careful when I'm using this, the uh, Super Sculpey, about what I, if I use spray paint on it, because it can be very reactive. Um, it's much, much more reactive than epoxy sculpt or a lot of other materials. So I'm very careful about spraying stuff on it, because I don't want it to go sticky. Um, if it goes sticky years down the road, it actually doesn't matter too much to me in the case of these guys, because I'm going to get them cast pretty soon after I make them. So as long as they hold up well enough to get the molds made, it's no problem. But it's definitely something to keep in mind, and I prefer it if they didn't go sticky at all. That would definitely be better. Here again, you can see why having the head separate from the body is so convenient. I can just flip it around any direction I want. That would be much more difficult if I had a heavy and fragile body attached. Whisker bumps are probably something that I'll add in an epoxy later on. They're one of the things that's very easy to do in epoxy and a little bit more annoying to do in sculpting. 